Timothy Weingard is assistant professor of history at Colorado Mesa University, and his new book outlines the insect's indelible impact on us. It's called The Mosquito, A Human History of Our Deadliest Predator, and it brings Timothy Weingard back to our studio tonight. It's very nice to see you again. Yes, you too. Thank uh, you. Um, so when we think of uh, mosquitoes, we think, oh, it's a little tiny insect. It might bug us in the summer. Uh, but you argue, and I quote, our war with the mosquito is the war of our, our world. How did this come to be? Uh, well, mosquitoes have existed since there's different dates that you, you get, but roughly 190 million years ago. Uh, so across our ancestral evolution and obviously our, our, our journey uh, in and out of, of Africa as human beings, um, it's been with us and been biting us for our, our whole existence. So um, those pathogens, uh, numerous pathogens that the mosquito transmits have been causing, unfortunately, death, um, suffering, and, and, uh, and disease to humans for as, as long as we've been here. So it's not just them biting us. If they just bit us, that's one thing. But because when they bite us, they pass stuff to us, and those diseases can be dangerous. Right. The mosquito untethered from a pathogen is harmless. Um, only females bite. They need uh, the blood of humans in a zoological Noah's Ark of other animals uh, simply to grow and mature their eggs. They don't know that they're actually passing on these pathogens. The pathogens essentially, essentially use the mosquito mm -hmm. as a free ride or hitchhike on board the mosquito to another host, which in this case uh, is, is humans as, as well as numerous other animals. And what are these menacing diseases? Um, there's essentially three categories. One is the worm category with f uh, filarial worms or filariasis, often mistakenly called uh, elephantiasis, which is the engorgement of the limbs and genitals, which is, is horrific. I've seen, um, I saw one, a person in East is, Africa, it's um, something. Yeah, yeah. The scrotum's the size of large beach balls, um, yeah. um, but thankfully that can be treated with really inexpensive medicine, um, mm -hmm. but a lot of where that occurs is in underdeveloped and unfortunately poorer parts of the world. So, so they the don't have expensive. access yeah. to the healthcare or to medicine. Um, so you still have r numerous millions of people contracting f uh, filariasis uh, across the planet. Um, then another category is a plasmodium a protozoan parasite, which is malaria. It's in its own category and it has been the scourge of humanity uh, across our existence. It is the paramount killer. Uh, and then the third category or class is the virus class, which includes yellow fever, uh, which was also the paramount killer of the virus class until a vaccine was developed in the 1930s. Um, chikungunya, dengue, West Nile, Zika, uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of viruses as well that, that, that she transmits while she's, she's getting blood to grow and mature her eggs. Because that's, it's a girl? Uh, yes, yeah, only a female females mosquito. bite, yeah. Um, when did humans become aware of the dangers of mosquitoes? Well, since Hippocrates in early, uh, early Greece, uh, and then this, this, the, the miasmic or miasma theory of medicine was that people got sick um, and, and from noxious fumes or particles rising from stagnant water and swamps. Like bad air? Yeah, bad air, miasma, bad air. Or malaria, literally in Italian, means bad air, mm -hmm. malaria. So they're tantalizingly close to fingering the mosquitoes that actually breed and live in these stagnant pools of water and swamps, but, but uh, not the actually mosquito itself. Mm -hmm. So that, the miasma theory was around um, from Hippocrates through Rome, really right up until the 1850s, which is shocking. And the, the modern germ theory of the 1850s by Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, and Joseph Lister, hence Listerine. Um, um, and then we really didn't uncover or unmask the mosquito as the culprit for all these diseases until really the 1890s um, with malaria. And then Dr. Walter Reed with the American invasion of Cuba, yellow fever. And so we start slowly started to to you know group together all these these many diseases that are vectored or transmitted by um, certain types of mosquitoes we're gonna go more in depth in some of those areas um, but how did the mosquito uh, wreak havoc on the ancient world 
Um, well, again, people didn't understand in healthcare whatsoever. It was more a world governed by the wrath of gods and superstition than it was anything um, concrete or tangible. So we look at campaigns in, in the ancient world from Alexander the Great, um, you know, meeting mosquitoes, malaria carrying mosquitoes at the Indus River Valley, um, which was part of the reason um, his army was halted and, and turned around in India. Um, and we think that malaria ended up killing Alexander in, in Babylon. Babylon um, as well at a, at a young age, and he certainly wasn't done uh, being great, if you will, um, but his life was cut short, we think, by malaria. His body's gone missing, actually, so we don't have concrete proof uh, that it was malaria. There's other theories out there, but um, malaria is certainly a, a front runner. A lot of the great wars that were won, uh, we might think it's because of the people who were fighting those wars. But sometimes it came to luck and the mosquitoes um, played a role in uh, attacking different armies. Right. Um, usually one side, <laughs> the, certainly mosquito-borne disease was more powerful than man-made weapons or uh, the minds of the most brilliant generals, and it's not to take away from those men and women. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it had to do with disease. And we have to keep in mind that really up until the First World War, 65% um, of, of uh, casualties during war were caused by disease. Um, and in some of these wars, those were specifically malaria and yellow fever. So uh, whether that's the, the American Civil War or any other war, so 65% casualty rates from disease, not really combat. That's, that's an average up until the First World War. So one side usually benefited from the destruction of the other side by mosquito-borne disease, specifically malaria or yellow fever, depending on where you are, are in the world or where you're fighting these wars. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to read something from the book, and this is about Rome. And you write... What Rome did not know is that she had a powerful ally inhabiting the 310 square miles of the Pontine Marshes surrounding and safeguarding the capital itself. The marshes, often referred to as the Campania, flanking the city of Rome were home to legions of lethal mosquitoes and were the defensive equivalent to armies of men. How did enemies of the Romans eventually overcome this barrier? They didn't. <laughs> so in a way, the, the, the Pontine or Pontine Marshes, um, they extend from Rome south towards Naples, um, Anzio, um, 310 square miles of swampland and malarious swampland with mosquito, malarious mosquitoes, acted as a shield essentially to allow Rome to, to grow um, and eventually be imperial, if you will. So when we think about Hannibal and the Carthaginians, he doesn't take Rome. He refuses to lay siege to Rome, even though he's running around Italy for more than 15 years. When we look at uh, the, the Vandals, the Huns, the Visigoths, all of them either vacate and don't try to take Rome or sack Rome for a brief period and then leave. Mm -hmm. uh, once malaria starts to sap into and rot the strength of their, their militaries. So we see it acting essentially as a shield, safeguarding the eternal city from foreign invaders who aren't accustomed to or what we call seasoned to that, that, that malaria of yeah. the Pontine Marshes. So, But it eventually uh, played a role in the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, eventually what you have is even though you may be seasoned, seasoning means meaning the more you contract malaria, the less severe the symptoms are and the, the, the likelihood of death decreases, but you're still sick. So how can you farm with all everybody being sick? How can you mine? So you're, it eventually starts to sap and bleed the vitality of Rome itself, and actually the capital is moved from Rome um, away from the Pontine Marshes. And you point out that during this time period, the mosquito also helped to spread Christianity. Um, how so? Well, given that Rome was an early hotbed of, of Christianity, underground Christianity, it was considered a duty of every Christian um, to care for the sick. Mm -hmm. So given that there was endemic malaria in Rome and surrounding Rome, um, they opened the first essentially true hospitals. So malaria um, sufferers would come and get cared for by these Christians in Christian hospitals um, and eventually convert to Christianity. Now, it's not the sole purpose. I would never be so historically reckless to say the mass conversion to Christianity was because of malaria, but certainly this endemic malaria in Rome and surrounding Rome um, and this free care and this duty to care for the sick by, by early Christian communities and these first true hospitals led to people um, converting to Christianity. 
because I guess they saw it as a healing religion mm -hmm. and as a, a as a religion of healing, and that's certainly um, in the the New Testament when you look at Jesus and those stories as well. You're seeing this healing attitude throughout um, the early uh, years of Christianity. What was the Columbian Exchange? The Columbian Exchange is the master. I, I think in the book I equate it to picking up a deck of cards and throwing it to the wind. It's the mass transference of ecosystems across the planet, mm -hmm. um, specifically when we're talking about Africa and Europe to the Americas mm -hmm. um, on the heels of, of the voyages of, of Christopher or Cristobal Colon, if you will, Christopher mm -hmm. Columbus. Columbus yeah. um, so it's, it's the transference of, of plants and people and diseases uh, across the planet, most specifically, as I mentioned, from Europe and Africa to the Americas. Um, I want to read something else from the book. At the height of the slave trade in the mid-18th century, the French and the English were each importing over 40,000 slaves a year. This uptick in tempo of African slavery in the late 17th and early 18th centuries was directly tied to the mosquito. How was the increase in the slave trade tied to the mosquito? Well, the two primary killers of uh, the pathogens vectored by the mosquito were malaria and yellow fever. And the ancestral birthplace of both of those pathogens is, is West Central Africa. So you have genetic responses to the f various kinds of human malaria, specifically vivax and falciparum, uh, evolutionary responses uh, through natural selection in Africa that act as ge uh, genetic shields to these malarias, whether it's the seasoning. Duff, yes, mm -hmm. Duff seasoning, mm -hmm. Duffy antigen negativity, sickle cell. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing also given yellow fever as a virus. If you survive yellow fever as a child in Africa, you're immune. So it was quickly realized by plantation owners in the Americas, unfortunately, that when they were bringing in European indentured servants, specifically in the, in the colonial uh, plantation colonies of the Caribbean, which is where most of those coffee plantations, sugar plantations, tobacco plantations were, that these European indentured servants were dying in droves from mosquito-borne disease, whereas Africans withstood the onslaught better uh, to mosquito-borne disease, making them more profitable to these plantation owners, thereby becoming profitable themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's a very unfortunate uh, aspect of that their genetic shields to withstand these mosquito-borne diseases mm -hmm. actually played uh, a part and a role in fostering um, the transatlantic slave trade to mm -hmm. the Americas. And you also write too um, that on the continent itself in Africa, um, while the while mosquitoes and certain mosquito-borne illnesses um, kept some of the colonizers away uh, and protected the um, African population, in a way, uh, in the end, it also harmed them. Um, can you explain that? Well, you, the transatlantic slave trade wouldn't really have been possible without African cooperation in Africa, and that's mm -hmm. it's an important point. And, and again, avaricious African leaders would, what was a very uh, cultural and, uh, and small-scale slave trade in Africa prior to European intrusion, it was very different than the, than the beast that becomes this chattel African slavery. So because Europeans couldn't venture into uh, the interior of Africa, really off the coast for fear of malaria, yellow mm -hmm. fever, they would you know die in droves. It was actually Africans kidnapping other Africans and selling them to um, the slave traders, the European slave traders on the slave forts on the coast of West Central Africa or what's known as the Slave Coast, the Ivory Coast, um, and then transported across the middle passages of the Atlantic. And one of the most surprising things that I found out in this book is that malaria was in Canada uh, and specifically in Ontario. Yes. Um, malaria, there was epidemics of malaria um, throughout Ontario. Um, the St. Lawrence River Valley and even in, 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 in um, Halifax in the Maritimes. There's also ye yellow fever epidemics in Halifax and Quebec City as well, which is shocking. Um, but during the building of the um, Rideau Canal, again, you're at, digging ditches and adding water is a recipe for a disaster. It's a cordial invitation to invite mosquitoes to breed. So there but it's was, cold. But they hibernate or they come with trade. Um, and then if, as long as the right mosquito species is there um, and you add the disease, you'll have a sporadic outbreaks of, of malaria. So they estimate that roughly 600 workers um, on the Rideau Canal died of malaria. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the chief engineer and contractor, John Redpath, um, he, he got malaria three years uh, of the building of the Rideau Canal, but 
don't worry, he didn't die. Mm -hmm. And you in Toronto may be familiar with John Redpath. He goes on to found the largest sugar company in Canada, Redpath Sugar, so he did which okay. is a, a landmark of the, yeah. the harbour here in Toronto, the big building. Yeah. So he ended up doing okay. He yeah. survived. Did Lord Simcoe's wife die? Of yep. And she didn't die. She oh, contracted she malaria in Kingston, which is, again, the terminus of the Rideau Canal. Mm -hmm. So what we also think um, happened is after the American Revolution, you have an influx of roughly 90,000 loyalists coming from the American colonies into British Canada um, or the United States uh, with independence. And a lot of these um, loyalists came from, from the Carolinas um, and Georgia as well. Um, and they brought malaria, seasonal malaria with them uh, when they came to Canada, coming from these malarial hot pockets in, in the southern colonies. During the Seven Years' War, you write that if malaria didn't kill the soldiers, the cure would. How did that happen? Well, again, really up until the 1850s with the germ theory, we didn't under, humans didn't understand what was causing these, these diseases. So if you don't have a cause, you can't really have a cure. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, the so-called cures, as Jefferson said, they, they got better despite the medicine or the Thomas Jefferson, despite the, the treatment, uh, and he's right. So everything from cupping glasses to, yeah. but bleeding was very common. So you'd open people up and bleed them and think you're going to get rid of the disease by bleeding people. It's actually how George Washington died. He was essentially bled to death. Um, using chipmunk brains as poultices, dead pigeons. I mean, there's all sorts of strange things. There was Taking, a desperation, yeah, it sounds, The right? ancient Egyptians bathed in human urine mm -hmm. to try to, as a cure for malaria. Mm -hmm. During the World War, even Walt Disney entered the game to try to prevent uh, the spread of malaria, and they created a film for Americans, uh, GIs. Let's take a look. Public enemy number one, Anopheles, the malaria mosquito, wanted for willful spreading of disease and theft of working hours, for bringing sickness and misery to untold millions in many parts of the world. If you watch the clip and it's on YouTube, um, you see like the seven dwarfs are in the yes. film. Um, what else did the American military do to protect its soldiers during World War II? Well, um, so obviously Walt Disney got in, into the act, that's 1943. Mm -hmm. um, also in 1943, we start to see um, before he was Dr. Zeus. Dr. Zeus wrote numerous pamphlets and cartoons with his usual Dr. Zeus. Mm -hmm. His Captain Theodore um, Geisel was his name. He wasn't Dr. Zeus yet. Uh, and they're quite humorous. Uh, the mosquito. And very sexual. Yeah. They're, 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 they're interesting. They're online as well. You can flip through some of his cartoons and, and um, pamphlets. Uh, DDT is really the Second World War, along with nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. is canisters of DDT, which was a, 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 an amazing amazing mosquito killer. Um, and Adabrin, which was one of the first synthetic anti-malarials coming on the back of quinine, which is from a, a tree, a natural, but it was um, certainly had worn out its welcome by this time. So Adabrin and then ev eventually chloroquine as well. Uh, Mussolini found uh, a way to almost eradicate the mosquito. What did Mussolini do? So one of his party's main projects was you have those pontine marshes, which is 310 square kilometers of what could be very fertile farmland mm -hmm. right on the doorstep of, of Rome. So Julius Caesar actually had a plan to, to drain the pontine marshes mm -hmm. before he was obviously killed. Mm -hmm. um, and so he didn't do it. Napoleon thought about it. Um, for whatever making trains run on time or not, uh, for whatever Mussolini was or wasn't, he did successfully drain and reclaim in this reclamation project the Pontine Marshes prior to the war in the 1930s and absolutely crashed the malaria rates, not only in Rome, but across Italy by almost 99%. It's actually a remarkable story of, of how successful this um, draining of the Pontine Marshes and, and reclaiming this swampland for agriculture was. Um, but the problem is, is when the Allies are, are planning to land in Italy in 1943 to circumvent the German line to, to, to march on Rome, um, Nazi malariologists purposefully reflood the Pontine Marshes in late 1943-1944 to reintroduce malarial, uh, malarious mosquitoes uh, to sicken and slow down the Allied advance. And so it's a deliberate act of biological weaponry used by the Nazis. Um, and they do do this. Uh, my wife's grandfather mm -hmm. uh, landed at Anzio and he contracted malaria at Anzio. 
um, as it, it, again, as a, as a, it was a deliberate act of biological weaponry used by the Nazis. Uh, nations around the world uh, took serious efforts during the 20th century to eradicate mosquitoes. Um, can you tell us about some of those campaigns? Well, I think coming out of, of, we found out very quickly during the Second World War when we have the Americans actually have a, a malaria project equivalent in secrecy to the Manhattan Project mm -hmm. uh, for the war effort to try to reduce malaria, specifically in the Pacific theater. It was just cutting the Americans to shreds. Also the Japanese, as we later found out too. But um, so General MacArthur was extremely worried um, and he has a quote, and I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but yeah. this is going to be a long war if for every unit I have in the field, I have one on leave and one in the hospital sick with malaria. So he urges the American government to just start develop a, a malaria project, which is actually quite sophisticated. <laughs> Part of that was DDT. And so they're spraying DDT in these active theaters of war, not only in the Pacific, but also in Italy uh, and Sicily. Um, and so we see DDT coming out of the Second World War as a universal lifesaver. It, it, is, a pan it is a wonder chemical for the eradication of mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Now the problem is, is it's not the surgical use of DDT uh, to target mosquitoes specifically that causes environmental degradation. Mm -hmm. What is it? Agri uh, DDT is made commercially available in 1946, and farmers carpet the planet mm. with DDT. And so Joni Mitchell is right when she reprimands farmers, farmers put away your DDT. Mm. It's the carpeting use of ag uh, DDT for agricultural purposes that leads to DDT getting into the food chain and such disastrous environmental repercussions, including cancers in, in humans as well. And it's, it's not, not, and it's not as it's effective not, on mosquitoes right, anymore, right? It's not the surgical use just on mosquitoes. The other problem is, is because we carpet the planet with DDT mm -hmm. for an agricultural standpoint, um, Mosquitoes develop very quickly develop resistance depending on the mosquito species It takes anywhere from two to 20 years for the mosquito to develop complete resistance to DDT the average is somewhere around seven years mm -hmm. So by the time we're rolling into the early 1950s and certainly into the 1960s There's there's mosquitoes crawling all over the planet that are already immune to DDT So Rachel Carson writes her, her seminal treaty silent spring, which is published in 1962 mm -hmm. But when the U.S. slaps a domestic ban finally on DDT in 1972, it doesn't have much to do with any environmental uh, political clout or really anything that Rachel Carson w wrote. And I'm not ripping on Rachel. Her book is extremely important mm -hmm. in kicking off the minor, mo uh, modern environmentalist uh, movement. But the fact of the matter is it simply didn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So why are we going to use it when it doesn't work? And we now know that it's causing all these negative effects to the environment and human and, and ourselves. Uh, and something that draws people together, um, uh, their dislike of mosquitoes, <laughs> I'm generalizing here, um, but it's also their cup of joe. Um, people would be surprised to learn that they actually or uh, owe their cup of joe, like their favorite Starbucks second cup uh, to the mosquito. Um, how, how is that? Well, we're not sure if this is truth or legend, but it's been passed down history as being truth, so we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, it doesn't actually matter whether it's truth or legend because people were drinking coffee as a malarial cure, whether the story itself of the origins is true or not. So um, in Ethiopia, there was a, a, a goat herd in Ethiopia who noticed that when his sick or lackadaisical goats ate um, these certain red berries from this plant, they perked up and they felt better. And so he tried these berries as a cure for his constant malarial fevers. And these berries obviously are coffee berries. <laughs> so the first cup of coffee, uh, whether it's an apocryphal story or not, w stemmed from goats and Kaldi, the goat herd, eating or brewing coffee to cure his malarial fevers. And you still see wandering goat coffee company. Mm -hmm. All these goats and Kaldi are mentioned in very a, lot, a ton of modern coffee shops and coffee brands as well. So that story has lived on into modern day um, as malaria being a cure, or, uh, coffee being a cure for malaria and the drink game popularity stemming from that. Mm -hmm. Really up until um, the late um, 1800s, yeah. we're still seeing advertisements that coffee cures malaria, uh, among other things. Um, so it, it might it be one hurt. of the reasons why uh, <laughs> the Americans switched from tea to coffee with the, the British taxes on tea and they became a, a nation of coffee drinkers as well. Well, it's not like I needed another excuse to drink more coffee, but there I have it. Uh,
Timothy, it's been great having you on the show. We've learned so much. This book is terrific. So much information about history, about science. It's a fascinating re read. Congratulations. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for your time. Of course, thank you. We recorded that interview before this global pandemic occurred. And so we wanted to check in with Timothy about how COVID-19 related to his research on zoonotic diseases brought on by mosquitoes. Hi, Timothy. Thanks for making a bit more time for us. Yes, thank you for having me back. I'm interested in how you see COVID-19, which like malaria and yellow fever, is a zoonotic disease originating in animals. Yeah, if we look at some of the just uh, bare statistics, roughly 61%, give or take, of, of human pathogens are actually zoonotic uh, diseases or pathogens. Uh, and in the last 10 years, actually, of all the emerging diseases in human beings, 75% are zoonotic. So we are seeing a little bit of an increase. And historically, if we look at all the you know, the deadly killers of humanity, influenza, smallpox, tuberculosis, uh, measles, uh, the common cold, all the bird flus, uh, swine flus, obviously they all come from, um, from animals. So it's uh, been stalking us across our human existence uh, and it really starts to kick in with the agricultural revolution roughly 10,000 years ago. Uh, prior to that, when human beings are, are hunter-gatherers across the planet, uh, the sustainability under that lifestyle is roughly 4 to 5 million human beings. And the population now, now is 7.8 billion. So um, it's really the dawn of agriculture that creates this environment for, for zoonotic or spillover pathogens to human beings from other animals. Uh, Timothy Weingard, thank you so much for giving us this update. We appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public, we advance our profession, we guide our CPAs, we are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you, thank you.